We gather in the name of the one who leads us by still waters. We gather in the name of the one who prepares a banquet for us. Let us worship God, let us pray together. Lord God, our good and loving shepherd, you nourish our lives and lead us into green pastures. You restore our souls with rest and peace. You give us true joy so our cup overflows with goodness. You walk with us through the darkest valleys, offering us courage and compassion. At all times and in all circumstances, you are with us, creator, redeemer, and guiding spirit. So we praise you, Holy One, now and always. Amen. Believing in your patient grace, together we offer now this prayer of confession together. Patient God, your mercy is abundant and your love endless. Trusting in your mercy, we confess that often we have not shown your love to others, even though we claim it for ourselves. You have called us to show compassion, but too often we are quick to judge others. We have been called to follow Jesus, yet we are distracted by our own plans and desires. Forgive us for falling short of your hopes for us and renew a right spirit within us. The assurance of pardon, the mercy of our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace us. We are forgiven and set free to begin again. Let us give thanks for God's most gracious, generous love. Amen. With that good news in our hearts, we invite the praise team forward as they lead us in song. And then afterwards, our elder today, David Mark, will lead us in prayer. Yesterday was an exciting day of uh, celebrating Rob's 50th birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, also celebrating my sister's 60th, so milestone birthdays yesterday. Um, in our lives, um, you may feel sometimes that your, your life is in ruins, but God can use um, what you feel is ruins into something great. Um, so that's why premise of the song glorious ruins based on isaiah 61 4 which reads they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places along devastated uh, long devastated they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations um, so I invite you all to stand if you're able Come to life. 
of your glorious grace. So let your goodness come to life in the beauty of your name, rising up from the ashes. Come forever you reign, and my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will love you forever and forever. Our next song is Great Are You, Lord. Your breath in our lungs, 
your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only thank you you may be seated Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here to do uh, prayers of hope today. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? Uh, gracious God, we place our hope in you. Your hope overcomes all things. Your hope heals our wounds, and your hope restores our souls. Your hope, it, it inspires us to action, and your hope conquers the power of death. Your hope frees us from the powers of this world, and in your son, Jesus Christ, we witness your hope made flesh. We give thanks for your hope in action. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we continue to pray for Paul Youth's mom. Uh, Lord, help her manage her pain and help her regain strength, Lord. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that um, she gains some of her appetite back to, to nourish her, Lord. And we pray for her comfort in, in her home and adjusting to her new surroundings. And we pray for Paul's family, Lord, as they continue to care for his mother. Be with them, Lord. Give them strength and patience during this time. We also pray for Amy Pong's mom, who's in Hong Kong. And we thank you, Lord, for providing a bed in the private hair care hospital for her and for the doctors for addressing her medical needs and placing her on the road to recovery and providing proper treatments for her. We continue to pray that for your intervention, Lord, and your presence with Amy and her family during this time. And we pray that Amy's mom will gain her strength and be well enough to travel back to Canada for further treatment. Place your healing hands, Lord, upon Amy's mom. We pray for the Women's Fellowship today as nine volunteers that will be traveling to Evangel Hall this afternoon. We ask that the preparations and the service of the meal to the patrons of Evangel Hall go smoothly and that you touch those in need and the underprivileged Lord in the community that Evangel Hall serves. Let, them patron, let the patrons and the people that go to Evangel Hall feel your presence, your blessings, your mercy, and your grace this afternoon. Pray for our brother Marius in his continuing conflict with his neighbor. We pray for his protection, Lord, and that he's shielded from further harm and stress as he navigates through this legal proceedings. Lord, we pray that there's a prompt resolution or quick resolution to this long-standing matter and that Marius can find peace and tranquility with his family once this matter is resolved. Pray for Sam and Linda as they continue to build their Centennial College ministry, outreach ministry. We pray to you, Father, that new leaders reveal themselves and that they have a heart for you, Lord, and looking to partner with Sam and Linda to spread your word and the gospel to the students at Centennial College. Father God, I, I pray for my neighbor, Angelo, who's been battling cancer for the last four years and was taken to hospice on Thursday. I pray that you make him comfortable while there, Lord, and that he is pain-free. May your blessings, mercy, and grace be with him. I pray for his wife, Susie, and for his sons, Jim, Chris, and Steve, that they find comfort and peace during this difficult time for their family. We also pray for those that are recovering from illness and surgery, Lord, for your presence and your healing hand to be upon them and for speedy and complete recovery. We lift up these prayers to you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, David, for leading us in prayer today. Let's dismiss our children to their classes as I draw your attention to some announcements to share with you today. Um, just going to highlight a few things that I want to make sure you know, and then David Chu will come up and do a special announcement as well. I was going to mention the women's group, but uh, uh, David mentioned them in their prayer, so we thank for the women's group for going down to uh, serve with the love of Christ uh, this afternoon. A couple of, um, how we say, continue education or discipleship opportunities for uh, for our church family. This coming um, Saturday, April 27th, this is from our presbytery. They have a couple of congregational development workshops that might uh, be of interest to us. Um, how small churches can be more vital and viable. And then along with that, they're doing a planned giving stewardship. Um, some, if not all, the elders are planning to go to this. It's up in Newmarket, St. Andrew's uh, Newmarket, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Newmarket, um, this Saturday from 9 till noon. If you are interested, please talk to David Chu. We might be able to arrange uh, carpooling and things like that. The deadline that they said was April 24th, so I'm going to ask you, uh, if you're interested, tell David by the day before, the 23rd, just so that he has some um, margin before that actual due date. April 24th is the due date, but let him know by April 23rd, and that's this coming Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, one more from the C.S. Lewis Institute, an opportunity just to learn about a discipleship and evangelism. In a way, God's providence is bringing all this together. We are in this series of apologetics. Here's another opportunity, how to have faith cons conversations. Um, we did a workshop with Sam and Linda. Here's another opportunity to learn about it. It's a two-day event with Dr. Randy Newman. He'll be coming and uh, sharing some time with uh, those who are interested. So that's Friday, May 3rd, 7.30 to 9.30 p.m., and then Saturday morning from 9 to 11 a.m. at the Richmond Hill Christian Community Church. I do realize that Friday evening, that's the prayer group time, so, uh, but maybe the Saturday you can all go for that, but I just wanted to let you know. Uh, the details will be in the next newsletter, and if you want, you can talk to Becky and Al Allen about that if you want more information. Let's invite David. Thank you, and uh, I just want to talk a bit about, um, or just announce uh, some details around uh, uh, Young Do Kang and his ministry. So uh, the details are in the weekly send out, but I just want to tell you uh, a little more about what's going on. So he leads a ministry for a hip hop music community, and uh, not a lot of us are part of that community, I suspect, but it is a, it's really based around music, and uh, it's kind of a, I think, kind of a marginalized or forgotten community, and it's great that Young Do has a ministry that focuses on this. It's, it's a one-of-a-kind ministry, uh, mostly in Toronto, where he reaches out to this, this, uh, uh, this group of uh, probably mostly uh, younger people. So um, he is uh, looking, he's a good friend of the church. He's spoken here many times, if you don't remember him, but he's spoken here many times. I believe he's coming back in May, and he also spoke at the recent youth retreat. So he's uh, looking for some, um, some extra funding. So he mentioned that uh, he needs about $1,500 a month to kind of keep the ministry uh, going as he has he foresees part of it is for his own living expenses he's got uh, you know two kids in university age so i can tell you what that's you a lot of people understand what that's all about too the costs involved in in just running his family but also his ministry is expanding and it's uh, it's growing and uh, plus inflation and all these things so he's looking at fifteen hundred dollars a month right now we give about twelve hundred dollars a year so about a hundred dollars a month um, and we're looking to increase that from $1,200 and, and uh, add 5000 to it. Now, to do this, it requires a, a congregational uh, 
um, approval, if you will. So two weeks from today, on, on Sunday, May 5th, just during service, uh, Pastor Billy will lead us and he will ask if we're okay as a congregation to release the $5,000 to um, uh, Pastor uh, Young Do. And it'll just be a show of hands, no secret battle or anything like that. And any questions or discussions will also we can have at that point. So we will do that on May 5th. I just want to let you know that, and it's $5,000. But you can also give personally in the link that Winston has put in the, in the uh, weekly notice if you'd like to give personally as well on top of what the church is doing. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's really the announcement. If you have any questions, you can always ask Young Do or even talk to me or Pastor Billy or any of the elders, and we can fill you in a little bit more. So thank you for your time. Thanks, David. I just want to reiterate something that happened at the annual meeting. Uh, for those of you attending, you realize that God has blessed celebration with uh, resources, and we, some conversation came out. How, how do we use the money rather than just hold? You know, I don't want to use the word hoarding it, but holding on to it. Can, can, there, can we find ways to? To, to, to be able to spend that for the building of God's kingdom and for God's glory. So if you remember that, and when Session found out about Youngdo's situation, uh, that piqued our interest because that's something that congregation members, you, you expressed an interest. Can we use the money in good ways so that we can glorify God and make a difference? And so uh, knowing Youngdo's history with celebration, Session felt that this was something that they would at least want to explore. But because it's after the general after the annual meeting, uh, do we wait till next year or can we do something about it? And so they felt that this will be something important enough to bring to your attention and ask for special consideration and then the vote. So that's the reasoning behind this. Uh, so we hope that you will prayerfully continue it, we, uh, consider it. We'll make another announcement next Sunday and then the following week we will do the vote. So we just wanted to make clear as to what's going on and we hope for your understanding. But thank you, David, for that announcement. Uh, let's uh, go into the reading today and then today's um, teaching. Um, as you remember from the coming off of Easter Sunday, we, we took the opportunity to use it as a way to challenge ourselves in the area of apologetics on the heels of Sam and Linda doing workshop for us and uh, we hear now about the, work, the, the workshop that's happening with C.S. Lewis. I think it's a great opportunity. It just ties in. And so my two cents and my offering is to give you uh, some things to think about as we spend uh, some Sundays together. So I hope uh, this is, will be an encouragement and a challenge to all of you. These sessions will be a little bit different. They're not necessarily teachings that I do from passage. We're going to be looking at different readings from different places. But I thought I'll read uh, from 1 Corinthians uh, verse, chapter 15, verses 3 to 6 as a way to, to kick it off. So let's hear the word of God. Paul writes and he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I think there's a good tie-in into our time of communion later today. Normally we do it on the last Sunday, but uh, just mapping the series out, I think it fits better today rather than next Sunday. So I hope uh, it will make sense and you will agree. Let's begin with today's question. It's going to be on the screen. Have you ever heard someone say anything similar to this? Jesus was a great moral teacher, certainly a good man. He made a difference, but he was not the son of God. Did you know that there is no, uh, there is no uh, contradiction in most modern, credible historians that Jesus was even a historical person? There's no doubt in that area. There's no doubt in that area. Jesus was a great moral teacher, certainly a good man, but he was not the son of God. Of God. Have you ever heard anyone say that? 
perhaps a teacher or professor at school, perhaps a friend, acquaintance of yours, perhaps a coworker, perhaps an influencer that you follow on social media. Here's the thing. When you read what Jesus said about himself, you quickly discover a major problem with this, quote, good moral teacher concept. And that is this, Jesus said some very outrageous things. For instance, he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be equal to God. He claimed to have the power to forgive sins. He claimed that he would someday judge the world. He claimed that he had power over death and so on and so on. So here's the problem. A man who is just a man, a a human being who's just a human being and says these kinds of things about himself, I submit to you, cannot be a quote, good and moral teacher. Can he? C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, you can call Jesus a fool, you can call Jesus a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. C.S. Lewis goes on to say this, and this is a very important challenge point. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about Jesus being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. In fact, he did not intend to. When it comes to Jesus, there are only three choices. Three choices. Either Jesus was a liar. He knew he was lying. His whole goal was to deceive as many people as possible on purpose so that they would follow him. He was a liar. Or he was a lunatic. He was crazy. He's paranoid, schizophrenic, visions of grandeur. Or three, he was in fact the son of God the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So he's a liar, lunatic, or he is Lord. Three choices every one of us needs to decide on. It's one of those three. Those are the only options that we have. Now you know where I stand. You know which one I believe. The question I want to ask you is what about you? What about you? Honestly. We're on this side of Easter, and it's an opportune time for us to really be challenged. What do you really believe? Do you have reasons to believe? Is Christianity true? Some of us are a bit shaky in our faith. My hope and prayer is this this, uh, number of weeks we're going to spend together will really be an eye-opener, a challenge, and encouragement to all of you. There are reasons to believe. There are reasons to believe in Jesus. And today we're going to look at just three. First of all, you can believe in Jesus because he is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Now, for centuries, the writers in the Old Testament, they predicted the coming of the one, right? The the Christ, the Messiah. They predicted specific things about this person, about his life. For example, uh, where he would be born, who his ancestors would be, how he would die, and so on and so on. They predicted certain events that would take place, how he would react in certain situations or circumstances, how people would react to him. Altogether, scholars say there's about 60 major prophecies, major ones, about 60 or so. And Jesus, he fulfilled each one. Now, let's have a little fun with us today on the screen. Now, if you're a skeptical person, you're going to say something like this in response. Yeah, but what if Jesus deliberately staged events in his life to appear to be fulfilling prophecy? He was a Jewish man. He knew the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Because he's crazy, maybe he deliberately did things so that it matches the prophecies about the so-called Messiah. For example, the prophecy that the Messiah will come from uh, Capernaum or Capernaum. I mean, Jesus could have intentionally, he knows the scriptures, so he moves there before he begins his ministry. Or the prophecy about the Messiah riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That wouldn't be so hard, right? You just find a donkey and just, ta-da, right? You just come into Jerusalem that way. 
In fact, if he was crazy enough, he could have engineered his own crucifixion just to fulfill prophecy. Response. It's possible. We can admit that. It is possible. Jesus could have set those up. But, but many other prophecies were outside of his control. For example, the prophecy that says the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. How do you figure that out? How do you engineer that? Or the prophecy that says that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And how could he affect faked the, the prophecy that the Messiah will perform miracles when he was constantly you know, surrounded by doubters and skeptics. Yeah, but what if the gospel writers made up these stories to make it look like Jesus was the Messiah? Hmm, good point. Well, if they became millionaires selling their books, then maybe we could entertain or suspect such a thing. But the truth is that is not what happened. They did not become celebrities. They became wanted men. Matthew was axed to death in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged by his neck to his death in Alexandria. Luke was hanged on an olive tree in Greece. John, John, the only one to die of natural causes, he was at one time thrown into a vat, or a vat of boiling oil, and he was later exiled to the island of Patmos. So I find it very difficult. I find it very difficult that these men would make things up. It is possible, but it's difficult to believe that they would make these things up and then stick to the story, even to the point of dying because of it. A skeptical person may say, yeah, but what if it was just an honest coincidence? Is that possible? The answer is actually it's not. In a book called Science Speaks, a mathematician and an astrophysicist, uh, he enlisted 12 different groups of more than 600 university students. And their task was to calculate the probability of one man, one man fulfilling, let's keep it simple, not 60, but just eight. Let's, what's the probability of one human being fulfilling just eight prophecies in that person's lifetime? For example, the prophecy that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. So they concluded that the chance of one man being born in Bethlehem at that time was 1 in 2.8 times 10 to the fifth power. So that's about 1 in 300,000. So the students, students worked their way through eight prophecies, and they discussed each one in, in depth. They examined various uh, circumstances that might indicate that the men had conspired together and so on and so on, and, and they made their estimates conservative enough so that they were able to re achieve unanimous agreement, especially with those who are very skeptical about these things. Conclusion. The mathematical chance of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies is one in 100 million billion. So that's one with 17 zeros after it. It's impossible to think that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament just by chance, just by mere coincidence. It's impossible to think that he manipulated events to make it appear that he was fulfilling prophecy. Because many of the prophecies were simply, let's admit it, it was beyond his control. And it's impossible to think that the gospel writers 
lied about Jesus, fulfilling these prophecies, because each one suffered greatly, greatly for what they believed and what they had written. So what choice are we left with? Can we take a step forward and we admit we can believe in Jesus because he is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies? Number two, you can believe in Jesus because he was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. Now, when I say he was raised from the dead, I mean it in the most literal sense, not in a metaphorical sense or a spiritual sense or an allegorical sense, literal sense, because that's what the Christian church has believed for 2,000 years. Skeptical person. Yeah, but what if Jesus didn't really die on the cross? He didn't really die on the cross. You may have heard this before. This is called the swoon theory. Swoon theory. Jesus didn't die. He passed out. He was so hot that day. And imagine the pain and suffering he went through. He just, he fainted. He passed out because of the pain. We can understand that. He swooned. So the Roman soldiers thought that he was dead. They thought he was dead, so they allowed him to be taken down from the cross and to be buried. And then in the coolness of the tomb, he had some time to kind of just, you know, he regained consciousness. He woke up. Then he rolled away the stone that was covering his tomb. And then he went, ta-da! He declared to disciples that, I am alive again. This theory is ridiculous for one simple reason. One simple reason. It is impossible to think that a skeptic, it is impossible that um, Jesus, he's hobbling around in pierced feet, right? He's weak from loss of blood. He is bruised and bloody from the beatings just days before. He is in desperate need of medical attention, so on and so forth. It is impossible to think he could then convince anyone that I am back from the dead. I have conquered death. A skeptic could say, well, maybe his disciples played, a, played along with the charade. Response, to the point of their own death? No, I don't think so. A skeptic could say, yeah, but what if the resurrection stories, they're really legends, legends that developed years after Jesus' death. Now, it is true in in history, uh, over time, fairy tales do develop about historical figures. For example, St. George was a real person, but he never killed a dragon. There are many legends about Alexander the Great, but none of those are included in two of the earliest biographies of his life. And they were written 400 years after he died. The legends developed centuries later. But here's the unique thing. But in the case of Jesus, his followers preached and taught from the very beginning that he died and rose again. Trivia, what is the first New Testament book? It's not Matthew, because in the beginning it's not. What's the first New Testament book? Lock it away. First Thessalonians is the first book that was written. First book. That was written around 49 AD. That doesn't mean Paul started talking about Jesus in 40. It means that leading up to it, right, he was teaching already, his ministry was going, and then when the opportunity came, situations arose, he wrote a letter, right? So think of it that way. There's a good process there. Paul taught that Jesus rose from the dead in his first letter, first official letter. In 1 Corinthians, which Paul wrote not too long afterwards, 56 AD, he recites a creed. Uh, Back in the first church, as you can imagine, paper, education, no cell phones or iPads or whatever, it was common for believers to memorize, recite 
creeds as a way of affirming their faith, things like that. So there were brief statements that summarize what do we believe. So in his letter in 1 Corinthians, Paul reminded them of one of the earliest creeds when he said, and I read it out loud, but it's on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For what I received, I pass on to you of first importance. This is so important. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then Paul goes on to say, notice, he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. So Christianity has always taught from the very beginning that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. Physically from the dead. It wasn't an idea that developed over a period of time. No, no, no. And remember, just as Paul said here, there were people still alive at the time that would be able to dispute those claims. Skeptic could say, yeah, but what if, what if it was a spiritual resurrection? In our day today, there are some liberal theologians and cl clergy that have come to that conclusion. Uh, Bruce Chilton, John Shelby Spong, there are a couple of well-known examples. But I have to admit to you, the more you think about that, the more you think about it, the less sense it makes. Here's why. Because it comes down to this. Either you can believe the eyewitness testimonies or you can't. It's one or the other. Either you believe or you don't believe the, the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Because it's crazy to conclude that the disciples didn't see what they thought they saw. Or that after the death of Jesus, they had some kind of experience, some kind of spiritual experience, existential experience. So they made up a bunch of stories about Jesus, seeing Jesus in the flesh. It doesn't make sense to me. The disciples believed Jesus was physically raised from the dead. That's why the empty tomb was so significant in the teachings of the New Testament. For example, in the book of Acts, Peter himself said it this way, Acts chapter 2. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David, this is King David, he died, he was buried. His tomb, in fact, is here to this day. But you know what? He was just a prophet. He knew that God had promised him on oath that God would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, David spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. I believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, because he was raised from the dead. He conquered death. There are reasons to believe. You may choose to not accept them, but there are reasons to think about, to consider. There are reasons to believe. Here's a third reason you can believe in Jesus. The radical transformation of his disciples, of Jesus' disciples. The radical transformation of his disciples. Going back to the story, when Jesus died, he died alone. Nearly all of his disciples abandoned him. Remember, Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The rest deserted him except for John. Why? Because they were all cowards. The disciples were all cowards. Next screen. They were all cowards. But who can blame them? Their leader just been killed. They were afraid that they would be killed next. But then something happened. Something happened. They were no longer cowards. They became bold. They, with, they went with courage, with boldness. They began speaking out about Jesus in public 
places. So think about it. These men who were once afraid of their own shadows could not be scared by anyone. They could not be stopped. They were beaten up, but still they preached. They were put in prison, but still they preached. They were tortured, but still they preached. The only way the authorities of that time could shut these men up was to kill them. And that's exactly what they did. All of the disciples except one died for their faith. Now earlier I mentioned what happened to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was no different for the others. A few examples. Philip was thrown in jail. He was flogged and crucified in the year 54 AD. Matthias was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem. Andrew was crucified in Edessa. This is modern day Turkey. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome during the persecutions of Emperor Nero. Bartholomew was beaten and crucified in India. Simon the Zealot was crucified in 74 AD. Thomas, we all know, Doubting Thomas, he was killed by the sword in Parthia, which is in modern day Iran. Question, what drove these men to be willing to die for the name of Jesus? Maybe they made a pact They came together, they made a pact with one another, and they they made a promise, an oath to one another, and say, hey guys, isn't this exciting? Let's keep the joke going. Let's Let's keep the gag going on. Let's see how long it can last, even if it means we get killed. Let's see how long we last. I don't think so. I don't think so. Why would these men die for what they knew to be a lie? Do you remember in 1997, the largest mass suicide inside the U.S.? It's a little dated, but it still stands as the largest mass suicide in history inside the United States of America. Do you remember when the members of the uh, Heaven's Gate cult, they all committed a suicide, remember, in California, Southern California. For those of you who don't know, they were willing to die for what they believed to be the truth. We know they were wrong. They were wrong, but they did not know they were wrong, okay? But they believed they knew the truth, and they were willing to die for it. So the Heaven's Gate members, they were sincerely wrong. They were sincerely wrong. But you cannot say that about Jesus' disciples. They either saw Jesus alive, or they didn't. And if they didn't, they lied. A lie that they knew would lead to their own death. No, something happened. Something happened to change the disciples. They claim it was a real face to face encounter with Jesus who came back to life. And you know what? I believe them. There's no other way to explain this radical transformation in their lives. Jesus is still changing lives today. I've experienced it, and many of you have as many of you have as well. I'm not saying we're perfect. It's a journey. Little by little, he's changing me. There are reasons to believe. From a purely academic perspective, a person can objectively determine that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. But to leave it at that will be to miss out on the best thing that could happen to you. And this is my invitation, and this is how I will end. You'll miss out on the best thing that can happen to you in your life. It could be, it'll be like you buying a piece of land. You find a cave in that land on your property. That cave is filled with all these pretty, colorful rocks. You call in the specialist. You call in the geologist. They tell you that the cave is filled with gold. 
And your response is, huh. Imagine that. It's real gold. And then you go back inside to watch Netflix. You never mine the gold. You never mine the gold and you never get to enjoy the riches that you have an opportunity to enjoy. Intellectually recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God is just the first step, the first big step. You have to go on. What you know in your head, you have to now act upon with your heart. Let me give you a couple of verses. Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can know Jesus beyond the academic sense. You can know him personally. You can experience his presence in your daily life. Jesus said it this way in Revelation chapter 3. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. If you haven't done this yet, why not consider it today? At least take the first step as we journey, make this journey in these number of weeks. Here's the main point. Whatever you may have heard, there are reasons to believe. There are reasons to believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, for some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing such teachings. For others of you, this might just be the encouragement that you needed. That you may live the life that God wants you to live. With that in our minds, I invite you now to join me at the table. Let's prepare to approach the table by together professing our common faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. The words are before you. Let's do it together. One, two, three. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God, as we celebrate what Jesus did for us, we ask simply this, be with us, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon this bread and this cup, that we may be one with Christ and he with us. Today we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. Fill us once again with the joy of eternal life, that we may be your faithful people. All glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite our two serving elders to join me up front, Winston and Harry. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. He prayed and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
do this in remembrance. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. All of you who publicly profess that Christ is your Savior and Lord are invited to take part. Let us remember we come not because we are somehow worthy, but the one who is worthy, he calls us to the table. Just a reminder that uh, we do ask you to take the empty cups uh, on your way out and uh, deposit it into the garbage. Wait for the sound to die a little. Think you're ready? The body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. There are reasons to believe. Jesus suffered and died for something he did not do so that you and I would never be judged for what we did do. The blood of Christ. Let us pray once more. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for Jesus, who was real, who lived, he died, he gave himself for us. As we prepare to go out into the world, help us in the strength of your spirit to follow suit, to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This closing song, um, this I believe, is also called the Creed, as Pastor Billy spoke of. Um, and the main part is, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit.
our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus. So I invite you all to stand if you're able. heads for our closing and final prayer for today. Brothers and sisters, there are reasons to believe. Jesus died and he rose again. He not only forgives our sins, but his erection proves that he has the power to give life to you or to change your life for that matter. You and I have this opportunity to live a brand new life. God, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the Old Testament. He was raised from the dead, and he is alive today, present, and he brings about change and new life in us and all around us. God, may be encouraged and challenged today to take one more step of faith to live the life you want us to live. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
Go out into the world in peace, whatever you do in word or action, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.